Hello, everybody, and welcome to another author interview. I'm very excited today to bring to you Mary Robinette Cole, the co-author of the original, which just dropped on Audible, as well as a very impressive back catalog of sci-fi fantasy we will be jumping into today. How are you doing? I'm doing really well, thank you. I've spent the weekend cleaning out my father's garage, so I am delighted to be here instead. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I can imagine the physical labor makes sitting down for an interview fee seem a little more appealing. <laughs> yeah, it's also, this is, uh, I am the fourth generation in this house, so the garage is, like, there's a lot of, and why, why do you have this? And yeah. what is it? <laughs> I just moved apartments. The amount of stuff I'd collected in just the eight months there was unbelievable. So I can't imagine generations of houses, how it can just, I imagine, accumulate. Yeah, yeah, it's it's impressive. Well, if you don't mind, we can go ahead and jump into this. You just released The Original, which is a novella you co-authored with Brandon Sanderson. And if you wouldn't mind, for my audience, do you have like a quick pitch you can give for what exactly The Original is? Sure. So it's uh, it's in the future. Holly wakes up. And she, you know, it's the classic white room scenario that you're not supposed to start with, but um, doesn't know where she is, doesn't know why she's there, finds out that she is a provisional clone. Uh, and they only make provisional clones when you've done something terribly wrong. And that, in her case, was killing her husband. Her job is to figure out why, how, track down the actual killer, which may or may not be her, and... Uh, has to do it within four days or she is terminated. So this is kind of the sci-fi that really interests me. It has interesting ideas, strong character, and a very thorough exploration of those ideas. It really seemed like you did your research on the implications of creating these kinds of clones, as well as this like theming that goes on within this world. Can you talk a little bit about how you kind of got into those ideas and how they became woven into the writing? Sure. So it probably helps a little bit to talk about how the story happened. Uh, Brandon had this idea. Um, of of the provisional clone and needing to track down your original. And he came to me with, uh, like, we, we do a podcast together, so we talk a lot, but he, uh, he pitched this. And when I said yes, he then gave me um, an outline uh, that might be as long as the actual story. Maybe not. It's Brandon. It's hard to tell sometimes. Um, and... Uh, and so he had a lot of those ideas in there and we talked about all of the different implications. And from there, basically what I do is I look at the way we interact with technology uh, over the, the span of time. Um, I look for mm -hmm. patterns. Uh, there are things that happen every time a new technology comes in. Some people embrace it, some people reject it. So thinking about the ways that, uh, that uneven access uh, as well as uneven embrace uh, of a technology um, it, it was it was just it was a lot of back and forth uh, there were some things that were in the original outline that didn't make it into the story uh, because when we poked at them a little more firmly it was like no yeah, that doesn't actually make sense and Brandon would be like yeah it doesn't and sometimes he'd be like oh no no but it does because of this and I would respond oh Yes, that does make sense. It was also a learning uh, opportunity for both of us to realize, for, for both of us, like how many things we think uh, are completely clear in an outline that are completely not. Well, that, that kind of, I would love to explore this more, how you co-authored this book, that experience. Is this your first time co-authoring? And, uh, you know, how was it as a whole? Yes and no. Um, I come out of live theater, so okay. I've worked on, in collaboration before. This is the first time co-authoring something that is prose. Uh, and it, it, was, it was really exciting and interesting because there's, um, there's the thing that happens in theater where a director tells you to do something and you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. And your job as, a, as an actor is to try to figure out a way to make it make sense so that you can deliver that vision. So in this case, because the idea was Brandon's originally, his, his vision for me was the one that we needed to, to adhere towards. But I also needed to be able to feel satisfied and feel like 
I was invested in bringing my own things. So at times when something didn't make sense to me in the, the outline, rather than just immediately pushing back, I would think, okay, well, how can I make this make sense to me? How do I, how do I do what, you know, he has laid out and then also bring something of myself. And because of that, it causes me to get out of the ruts that I'm usually in. It's, it's a lot of, it's really a lot of fun. We, we did a lot of conversations very late at night, uh, talking through implications. And it was, it was just, it was mostly an excuse to hang out with Brandon. <laughs> Well, that's actually, so as it went more and more, did the process become smoother as you kind of learned each other's writing habits more? I mean, the notes back and forth, I imagine they become more comprehensive or maybe less so as the vision becomes like, how did that specific like technical aspect evolve? So the, the technical aspect was like, he gave me an outline and then I wrote the thing. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I handed it to him, but I would, I would stop periodically and when I hit something that um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a non-spoilery uh, example. This, this is something we cut actually. So it's definitely not a spoiler. Um, he had uh, robots that you could get a substitute robot. So if you didn't want to go to work, um, then you could just have a robot come in and it would theme itself to look like you and it would carry out all of your interactions. And I'm like, Okay, so if we have robots that are that sophisticated with AI that is that sophisticated, then why aren't they occupying more pieces of the the supply chain? Like why why aren't they the ones that are you know doing the tracking down? Why why do these things exist? And Brandon was like that is a that is a good question. <laughs> and, um, and so we, we tossed it, we, we, we um, sent some ideas back and forth uh, before we, we decided to just cut it. And ultimately the reason we cut it was because it wasn't serving the story. It was a, an extraneous piece that led to, um, to things being confusing and, and it wasn't, it wasn't supporting the, the, basic idea. It was just bringing in another piece of technology that was cool, but the price we were going to have to pay to make it make sense was going to distract from the main story. It's it kind of like there's that well-known quote where, you know, a uh, good sci-fi doesn't just predict the, car, predict the car, it predicts the traffic jam. It almost seems like one of those instances where predicting the traffic jam meant, oh, we can't have the car. <laughs> we can't do that. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And, and I actually think that that's, that's the way good world building works is that you do that back and forth between seeing the car, the traffic jam and going, no, nah, maybe not. <laughs> Let's back away from that. So is there more plans for this kind of uh, the, the concept of the original? You know, you, you work with Brandon uh, often on the podcast as well. I mean, it seems like you guys have a health. Is this going to be something that spawns off more future stories, you think? Um, it's hard to tell. We, we've talked about doing some other things. And I know that he um, had ideas for additional stories set in this world. Mm -hmm. But... Um, both of us have a very strong case of uh, too many ideas, not enough time, um, which is similar to what happens to anyone who likes to read as well. It's too many books, not enough time, um, except that in our case, we also keep con generating books that we don't have enough time for. You're adding even more to the problem than people like me have. <laughs> And to myself too, because uh, you know, ultimately, the thing a storyteller is doing is telling himself a story first. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd actually love to transition from there into your rather interesting resume, because you know, I get sent, "Hey, you're gonna this author, you want to interview them?" I, I do my little bit of stalking; it's part of the job. You have a very interesting history here, not only an expansive back catalog of books, but you mentioned a, a relationship with theater and puppeteering and narrating your own books. I'd love to touch on the puppeteering first because that is interesting. So how how did you get started with that and what exactly was that part of your career? Puppeteering um, is, the, is the majority of my theater career. Um, I okay. spent 20 plus years doing puppetry. Um, most of that was full time. Uh, really, it's only been the past five years that I've been mostly a writer. 
So I perform every style of puppetry, like hand puppets, marionettes, shadow puppets, body puppets, the the whole gamut. I've done seven different productions of of Little Shop of Horrors. I've been on Sesame Street. Uh, I performed on a show called Lazy Town in Iceland. Um, I've toured to uh, 80% of the elementary schools in Idaho. I mean, it's like, basically, um, if you have an inanimate object and you have a paycheck, I will wiggle that dolly for you. (laughs) That's fantastic. Uh, So getting on Sesame Street, still an all-time career highlight. I imagine it has to be in some way. It's pretty great when when you when you get to be on a show that you you grew up watching. Um, plus, the the puppetry community is pretty small, and Sesame Street is filled with the nicest people. Like I cannot, that they, they are here. Here is how nice that everyone associated with Sesame Street is. My my first day uh, on on the street. So I had done the film Elmo and Grouchland. Um, and an astute observer can spot me as a human extra. But uh, so I'd done the film Elmo and Grouchland. I knew all of the performers, but it's like the difference between saying that you did the movie X-Files versus doing the TV show X-Files. You, you want to be on, you know, the TV show, the street. So I, I'm there. It's my first day. And I'm supposed to be doing um, Oscar's right hand, but Oscar is in a non-standard trash can. So there's only room for one person, which is fine. Um, I've, I've performed Oscar's right hand before I've done, you know, I've like, I know everybody. And plus I'm getting paid very good money to hang out on Sesame street for the day and watch. I have no problems with this, but second day, no, no, it's the first day. It's still the first day. The, the director um, sees me and uh, and he's like, wait, Ma- Mary, Mary Robinette hasn't been in? She hasn't, but this is her first day. We, we got to get, what, what can we get her in? What can we, and, and someone explain the entire non-standard trash can. And so he uh, he arranged to pull me into a shot so that I could have performed on my first day. So... I was, and this is a lot of training, uh, and I'm so honored that they trusted me with it. I was a piece of pizza on a stick. (laughs) I love it. My job (laughs) was to fly the piece of pizza through the frame, hit Grover in the face, and then think about the consistency of mozzarella and how it would adhere to the fur, slowly slide down, and then release. (sighs) 25 years of training. I mean... I would be one of those people who overthink it to the point where I screwed it up. <laughs> well, there was one point where I got caught on Elmo and he's like raising up and the pizza comes back up into the frame. And I'm just like. <sighs> I actually wanted to uh, get into, you said you brought you were brought to Iceland as part of your career. I actually wanted to get into that. How exactly does puppeteering bring one to Iceland? And then how was Iceland? It's a pretty general question. So there's a, fil- a show called Lazy Town. Um, mm-hmm. You've probably seen memes of it. A uh, little girl with pink hair, uh, guy Sporticus with a mustache, and then puppets as well. Um, it's filmed in Iceland because Sporticus, who's a man named Magnus Schöving, um, was Icelandic, wanted to have the show in his home so that he was getting work for friends and family and, and you know supporting the economy. Video puppetry is a very specialized skill, and there was one video puppeteer in Iceland, um, Gumi Thor, uh, and he's fantastic. He's very skilled, but they needed to bring in other people. So I was brought in uh, as a mid-season replacement for, um, it's an assistant puppeteer, which means that I was the live hands of the characters. So um, if you've seen Ernie, he has live hands. Uh, It's basically gloves. Um, And then you're attached to the other puppeteer. So you're like this. It's great. My my physical therapist loves me um, because I make sure they get a lot of work. And uh, and so, you know, like having to throw basketballs and make cherry cream pies and all of this above your head uh, while looking into a monitor where everything is one dimensional uh, with gloves. Uh, anyway, so I did that, um, and it, we filmed. I was I lived in Iceland for a year and a half, 
Uh, and Iceland is amazing. I would move back there in a heartbeat if I could afford it. It's mm -hmm. so beautiful. The people are just wonderful. Um, it's such a small population that in order to kind of keep the economy going, everybody has multiple jobs. So you've got someone who's like, here, I am the cameraman. Uh, and then I'm also in this incredibly good band. And may I make this dress for you? Now, I mean, it's not quite that bad, but it's, it's um, everybody, it, it's such a good art scene. Uh, and yeah, it's, it, and they, they really take care of their own. Like once they, you are in and you are part, considered family, uh, they watch out for you. That's, that's great. I love hearing that. Uh, so I want to get, so moving into what people are probably tuning in for, your incredible back catalog of literature is something I'm unfortunately just now getting into. I picked up the Calculating Stars and am hooked. Uh, I don't want to get too deep into spoilers, but it starts with a bang. I think that's fair to say. I think that you can talk about that. That happens on the first page. I, I think the fact that I slam a meteor into Washington, D.C. is fair game my hometown so thank you for that uh don't worry it kind of deserves it so i'll back you up there <laughs> yes uh it is canon that everyone that you loved uh was out of town on vacation that day i thought you were gonna go the other direction with that i was gonna go like well uh well thank you i appreciate it canon everyone you okay. loved happened to be out of town on vacation that day appreciate it uh but it is a rather lofty book in terms of a lot of the themes it's covering uh, a lot of discussion of sexism and things along those lines and it's been very striking for me you know as someone who's a straight white guy reading this stuff you know it's something i've been trying to educate myself on better and better and i just want to say i appreciate you doing handling it so bluntly because it's something that needs to be done more like that you know really show people what people have to put up with and um how how exactly did, I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, but the concept for the Calculating Stars come to be? And how did you decide to execute this story? Because it's kind of bold to slam a meteor into DC. <laughs> yeah, these East Coast cities get destroyed all the time. Um, East Coast and LA. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, occasionally Paris or Tokyo, but mostly, you know. Um, so there, there's a couple of different ways to talk about the genesis of this because the, the Lady Astronaut universe began as a short story. Um, and then there's the Lady Astronaut of Mars, which is a, a novelette. But the, the, when I wanted to do the novel, what I was thinking about was what would it take for a woman to go into space earlier? And, and I was fascinated with uh, the idea of punch cards and um, and computers. And my own computer just pinged uh, because although I have it set on silent, uh, technology is great and uh, my parents can punch through. So I oh, am good. Uh, but my dad worked for IBM. And so he, he would take me to, to work and there were the big gerbil tubes that you'd walk through and um, and the computers were all these big reels and, and punch cards. So I was fascinated by this and I wanted to play with this world. Um, and I also love space and I love astronauts and wanted to play with the idea of getting women into space early. And the, there's this very narrow window in which women, um, well, there's not a narrow window in which women are computers, uh, but there's a narrow window in which women are computers and we have space flight technology. Um, and it's, it's about a 10 year period before com digital computers or com mechanical computers take off. So many of the early calculations uh, were, were actually done by women by hand. If you've seen Hidden Figures, you, you know a lot of that. But even before that, uh, with uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, if you read the book Rise of the Rocket Women, you're, you're seeing all of these women who are involved in this and, and doing these calculations. So I thought, well, if, if I want to send a woman into space early, um, what I do is I set it when if you want a computer to go into space, it has to be a woman. And so you have to you have to send women up. Um, so I have this this narrow window, which is why I um, if if you pay attention, I actually the timeline diverges before the meteorite hits, 
um, because uh, Dewey defeats Truman. Yes. Um, so, and they already had satellites up, which they did not in, in our real world in, in 1952. But, um, but it gave me that, that opportunity to get people up. Um, and mostly that was just because I l like, I like punch cards. I like early, um, all of the early space stuff. Like the fact that we were able to go to the moon with less computing power on the entire planet than I have in my very annoying phone. This is, this is amazing to me. And like, what would have happened if we had continued to throw money at it at the same rate that we did during the Apollo program? What would have happened if everyone had been cooperating and it wasn't this jingoist, ah, oh, we'll get there first. Like what, what would the world have been like? So that's that's what I wanted to play with, um, but it unfortunately involved slamming a very large piece of rock into our capital. I, it was not I, wish what, fulfillment what, when I wrote it. With you know, I was about to say, is it wish fulfillment? I'm not sure. As someone who I was a software engineer for a while, you represent computing extremely well, uh, and you also have a very I can tell your love of space and science comes through in the pages. Like it seems very genuine and authentic, which is you can't fake that in my opinion. You know, it it comes across, and so I I, I have to ask. Star Trek fan? It seems like Star. Okay, yeah, it seems like Star Trek fan. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very much. Um, like, why is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for my generation, it is. Not all the people, you know, my age are. But I'm a TNG pretty hardcore. Is it TNG for you, or I am? Uh, I am Star Trek. Yes, uh, which is oh, like. Okay. Um, there's a spaceship and transporters and uh, people trying to do the right thing. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in. I uh, I, th I say that specifically because you're, you know, yes, there's this tragedy, but your view of the future still seems very optimistic, still very hopeful. And that's what I love about Star Trek. There's hope in the face of adversity, which I think came, came through in Calculating Stars. My, I'm 80% away done with it, but I've gotten that quite powerfully. And I actually just kind of want to transition from here into your sheer output. I think it falls into, oh my God, level of just awards and books and short stories and they're everywhere. I, I, do you have advice? Because I get asked all the time, hey, I have writer's block. How should I get past it? And I'm like, I don't have one book out. As someone who has got a back catalog, what is your advice to writers who may be struggling to get their idea on the page? How do you, you know, encourage them and get them moving? Okay, so there's there's a couple of things. First of all, um, since this is video, uh, I will let you know that actually if you search for this phrase, sometimes writer's block is really depression um, or just writer's block depression koal, uh, you should get to my website where there is a blog post titled that. Here's the thing. There are um, a number of reasons that we don't write. And I think that for the most part, writer's block is a gift to the writer because it is letting you know that there's a problem with the story. Sometimes it's not the story. Sometimes it's stuff that's going on externally in your world. For instance, if you are having trouble writing in 2020, welcome, welcome, all of us are, all of us are. Um, that's not you, that's not the story. That's your narrative cycles being spent on uh, this. But uh, for everything else, what's going on is that you've basically, uh, you're triggering your reader instincts. You've spent your entire life honing your skills as a reader and you've got good reader taste. So what's happening is as you're writing, some part of your brain, your reader brain is going, Oh, this is actually a little dull and probably right. So if you find yourself getting drowsy, um, you're probably boring yourself. If you find yourself uh, getting restless um, and like, you know, the thing where you, you're sitting down and you're going to write and then suddenly you're in the kitchen doing dishes and you're like, how did I get here? Uh, what this is, is this is a flight instinct. This is because you know that next section when you get is going to be hard. 
uh, whether it's mechanically difficult or emotionally difficult. Um, then there's the thing where you keep rewriting the same sentence over and over and over again. Uh, this is frequently an indicator that you don't believe it. You don't believe this scene. You don't believe this moment. Um, and take a hard look at it because sometimes what you need to do is just pull that entire thing out and uh, and you know take another run at that scene but there's something about that scene or that moment uh, that you don't believe frequently you can just cut it uh, so those are the kinds of things um, so that's it that's like I think writer's block is a gift then there's the other part of I have trouble writing, which is the rest of the world is competing for my attention. And that is a different animal. That's a totally different thing. Um, that, that involves things like figuring out what the barriers are between you and writing. Is it that you get distracted by the internet? Okay, well, you, then you know what your problem is, don't you? You already know the answer to this. Yeah, yeah, you. You. I'm looking at all of you. Yeah. This feels very personal to me right now and accurate. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, I see you. John? Um, so, uh, oh, Julie, really? You've stopped writing to come watch this? So your answer is that you need to turn off the internet if mm -hmm. that is the thing that distracts you. Um, you, I have a friend who knows this and also knows that she can get around every piece of uh, babysitting software. So she has a separate computer for, um, for internet that does not have a modem. Oh, wow. Well, that works. That will, that is a physical limitation that works. <laughs> so figure out what the barriers are that prevent you from, from doing the work. Make a bargain with yourself. My bargain is I do three sentences a day. Um, sometimes those three sentences are, I'm tired, I hate this, I'm going to bed, but they are three sentences. And most of the time what happens is that I actually catch a little fire and, and write farther. Some days I really do only write three sentences. Um, I've got a story, I um, can't remember the name of my own piece of fiction, uh, forest of memory. And I wrote that three sentences at a time because I was in the middle of a very bad piece of depression. Uh, but I kept going. Don't always. <laughs> 2020. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate the really uh, direct talk around mental illness as well, because that is under addressed with a lot of these issues and it's important to discuss. So thank you for that. And as well, when it comes to, I, I want to say like, you know, when you have those three sentences and you start rolling, I suffer from this and many of my subscribers who have messaged you suffer from, you know, constantly second guessing where you like what you wrote and then you go back and read it and it's like, no, I hate it. And they want to delete it. Do you have a way of overcoming that kind of self-consciousness in your writing? Sure. Um, there's a couple of things. One is uh, if you hate it, two choices that are kind of kind of two. Um, either you hate it because there is something wrong with it. Um, in which case, ask yourself, why specifically do you hate it? Like, what is what is actually wrong with it? Is it like, well, this sentence is clunky? Um, or, uh, and then and it's like, well, why is it clunky? Um, is it because you're uh, repeating the same sound too often? Um, is it because your syntax, or like, why? Uh, so ask, come up with a specific why you, you hate it. If you can't come up with a specific why you hate it, then it's probably just chattering brain monkeys. Um, those, those you can safely discard. That is a great term, chattering brain monkeys. Never heard it, but I know exactly what that is. <laughs> I got that from uh, Ken Skulls, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so you as well narrate many of your own books. I, I, some, I tried getting into book narration, failed miserably, never gonna do it again. How did you decide to get into it? and? you do it well how did this come about what were you just like you know i want to control my stuff so that was kind of what started me down that route no it wasn't that no, angle no no the narration and the audiobooks were uh, uh, the narration and the writing were totally separate um yeah. i have always loved audio fiction i loved uh radio drama um i listened to hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy before it was a book um oh, wow 
Oh yeah, the radio play is fantastic, and um, and picking up the annotated radio scripts, so much fun. And with puppetry, you're doing a lot of voice work. So I I actually took radio in college, um, used it in puppetry, and then um, like I went through a period of time where I was reviewing audiobooks again before I was really really doing a lot of writing, or certainly not. I think it was before I was publishing anything. Um, so I just, like, I like audio fiction. Uh, and puppetry prepared me because you're you're doing, <laughs> you spend a lot of time talking to yourself as a puppeteer. And audiobooks are basically puppetry without the pain. Um, I don't have to crawl into tiny cramped spaces. I don't have to hold my arm over my head. Puppet doesn't, there's no puppet. There's no, you know, you just good chair, microphone, um, closet. We are in my recording studio right now. Normally there's a uh, curtain that goes across. Gotta get that sound barrier in. Yep. And uh, so I auditioned for, uh, for audiobook narration. Um, most of the work that I was doing initially was with Brilliance Audio. I do... Uh, obviously um, other places uh, and when it was time for me to narrate my own book when when we sold my book I asked if I could narrate it and I had to audition and the only reason that they let me audition was because I had a track record as a narrator wow okay well it worked out I'm happy to hear that it, it went the way it did and there was a specific thing you said in a recent live stream with Sanderson that really interested me because I'd love to get more context for this you said the original was written to be an audiobook what exactly does that mean because that, that's I've never heard that before so there there's a couple of things that work on the page that don't work so well in audio um, and vice versa um, so one of the the things, and this this was actually a thing that we Brandon and I had to talk about, um, was that on the page you can have someone leaving messages, and that you have no idea who's leaving them. But when you're in audio, you can hear the sound of the person's voice, and if it's a character that you've already introduced the reader to, unless they are consciously masking their voice the reader recognizes their voice. So that reveal isn't a reveal. You know, someone walked into the room and it's partway down the page before you realize, uh, you know, oh, it was, it was a man. And you're like, I mean, it is true that there is a wide range of voices, but for the most part, what happens when you hear a voice is that you attribute stuff to it. You attribute age and class uh, and race and uh, gender, uh, and often you ter you you do discover that you're wrong, but it, that's not how it's written on the page. Um, so stuff like that. Uh, but specifically, one of the things that that I do when I'm writing for audio, and I know it's going to be an audio, is that it gives me some freedom to have some ambiguity with language and let the narrator play with it which also then means that I can frequently make my dialogue significantly more compact. Because if I, if I have the word what on a page, you know, that, that could mean a bunch of different things. But if I, if I have what, and then in parentheses next to it, disbelieving, then I'm going to get a narrator who goes, what? Right. Which is like rendering that on the page what she said with disbelief is not the same thing. Fascinating. So there's almost a whole nother prose approach you have to have. That's really interesting. And so now when we get the book version of the original, if that's planned out, is it going to be rewritten a little bit or how would you? Yeah, that's something that we talked about. Um, uh, there were a couple of things where I flagged when we were writing it. I was like, this, uh, this, this is going to work in audio and will absolutely have to be redone for, for prose. Um, 
and and some f- frequently it's that kind of thing where I, I'm being consciously ambiguous because I know that I have this other layer. There's also the choice creatively with the original specifically to add ambiance to so to say where there's this sound of wind and technology occasionally. I'm gonna be honest, usually that bothers me, but it was done very minimally and like I, I almost want to say like eloquently uh, throughout the original. Was that something that you had a lot of creative input in, or you know how did that specific aspect come into it? Um, I actually had almost no input into that at all. That's that's all okay. mainframe. Uh, that's something that Max really wanted to do from the beginning, um, and Brandon as well. So there were a couple of things that we talked about, uh, and I can't remember what they were now. So there were a couple of places where I did ask for something to be supported by a particular sound and text. But for the most part, uh, that was decisions that that they made in post-production um, on on how to support it and and add additional layers. I, I knew going in that they were going to be adding additional layers to the nightclub scene. Like I wrote it so that it would work with it just in case there were not sound effects. Um, but uh, but there was a lot of stuff that we were able to pull out once that the the uh, the sound effects were we knew that they were going in. We were able to to streamline some of that, which then gives you more space for action. Yeah, well, the the final result is a quite tantalizing uh, sci-fi novella that I deeply enjoyed, and I recommend everyone check out in the description down below. I'll have links for that, as well as The Calculating Stars, which I'm currently reading. I know a lot of people like to read what I'm reading, so finally, I'm giving you an opportunity to do so. And uh, I wanted to say thank you, Mary Robinette, so much for willing to come on the channel and have this talk with me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was, it's, you're delightful. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, go ahead and like and subscribe, everybody, if you've not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here, and have a good one. Peace.